Good evening. Welcome, everyone. My name is Indra Mungal. And on behalf of the Asian Art Museum, I would like to welcome you to tonight's virtual program and thank you for your support. The museum is open and we invite you to join us. Please visit our website to learn about our fantastic current exhibitions and as well as our uh, galleries, our permanent galleries, wonderful work there. Tonight's program is honoring Shell Mounds, artistic collaboration with the Ohlone community. The Asian Art Museum acknowledges that we are located on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards of this land and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramatush Ohlone have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place, as well as for all peoples who reside in their traditional territory. As guests, we recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. We wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Rame Tush community and by affirming their sovereign rights as First Peoples. The Asian Art Museum is undertaking ongoing actions towards deepening our work beyond land acknowledgement statements. We will continue to do programming such as tonight's and are planning some programs we hope to be able to announce later this year. We are exploring physical representation of the unceded territory on which the museum is located and we'll be working with Ohlone consultants and a consortium of other arts organizations that want to show deep, authentic respect and appreciation for Ohlone people's past and present. Throughout the night, we will be posting actions you can take to support the Ohlone community, a few of which are undertakings of Karina Gould, one of tonight's presenters. Tonight, we will hear the history of the Richmond Shell Mound environmental artwork, the collaboration between the artist Masayuki Nagase and the Ohlone community. You will also hear about the importance of the Shell Mounds, which are sacred Ohlone burial sites, and how public art can serve to honor local indigenous communities and educate the general public, as well as other efforts to reclaim Shell Mound locations. I'm very proud to, very honored to introduce our presenters for tonight. Karina Gould is the tribal spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lishan Ohlone. Born and raised in her ancestral homeland, the Ohlone territory of Huchin, she is the mother of three and grandmother of four. Karina has worked on preserving and protecting the ancient burial sites of her ancestors throughout the Bay Area for decades. She is co-founder and co-director of Sigorate Land Trust and we'll be posting that in the chat for you to check out. Tonight, Karina will be joined by her daughters, Deja Gold and Cheyenne Zapeda. Masayuki Nagase was born in Kyoto, Japan. Yuki began his career as an artist by studying painting at the Academy of Fine Arts in Tokyo. He then trained in traditional sto stone carving with an apprenticeship in the granite quarries of Inada in Ibaragi Ken Prefecture in Japan. He has participated in a number of international sculpture symposiums around the world. Yuki established a stone carving studio on the Adriatic coast of Croatia, and he exhibited and completed a number of public art projects in Slovenia. In 1997, Yuki moved to the United States and established his studio with his partner, Michelle Ku in Berkeley, California. He has been working in the field of public art for the past 20 years. In his public art projects, Yuki explores the expansion of humanity through the intersection of art, nature, and community. He has found that the interactive process of public art can be a channel for reclaiming connection and communication for communities. He believes it is through the contact and dialogue between diverse groups that creates a new expression and a deeper understanding for all involved. 
And we are also joined by Michelle Seville, who served as the city of Richmond, California's arts and culture manager from 2004 to 2019, during which time this project was envisioned and as interim director of Richmond Arts Center. Prior to her work in the arts, she had a varied career, which included working as a park ranger for Rosie the Riveter World War II Homefront National Historical Park when it was first established in 2000. And a side note, River, Rosie the Riveter Historical Park is very close to the park you're gonna hear about tonight, which is an awesome pairing. Uh, we're going to ask you in terms of housekeeping to please put questions in the Q&A box only. It's at the bottom of your window if you look in your Zoom window and uh, not in the, we're disabling the chat for that purpose tonight. And then also, if you would like closed captioning, look at the box that says live transcript. You can um, click on that and up at the top, it'll say enable the closed captioning. So without further ado, I am so pleased to welcome all of our presenters for tonight. Thank you all. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Karina Gould. I'm the tribal chair and spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lashan. And I am in my home territory tonight in the East Bay. And I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much to the Asian Arts Museum for pulling us all together to talk about this incredible work um, that we've been doing to create Oakway Park. Um, I want to talk a little bit about shell mounds and um, I want to say hello to all of our relatives and friends that are out there participating tonight. I went through the participation list and saw many people that we know and have supported the work that we have done and have in, um, been included in protecting the shell mounds across the Bay Area for the decades that we have been doing this work. I want to just start by saying that we want to honor and acknowledge our ancestors, the ancestors that uh, stood before us, that were here and prayed for us for the last seven generations, as we today pray for the next seven generations of those yet to come. And I want to thank all of your ancestors for bringing you here today so that we can create a community and a world that we uh, want for our future, a betterment for those yet to come. And part of that is the work that we do in preserving and protecting and remembering the landscapes that have been here since the beginning of time. Our ancestors, the Lashan people, are situated on the East Bay side. We um, are part of many, many different tribes of Ohlone people. And Ohlone is actually a generic term. It's a term that was taken up by uh, folks that have lived here since the beginning of time back during uh, the 1950s and 60s when people decided they didn't want to be called Costanoan anymore. And Costanoan was a name that was given to us, a huge swaths of us that were given this, uh, this name Costanoan people from the coast because invaders from Spain came and they said they, they looked at all of these people along the coast of the bay and said, oh, they kind of all look alike and they kind of all dress alike and they eat the same kind of foods. And so we're going to call them people of the coast, Coast Dinoans. It was our relatives afterwards that decided that as part of their sovereignty is to rename ourselves Ohlone. And we took that name from a village site in the southern parts of the territory called Ohon and began to call ourselves Ohlone. And uh, that name has stuck. But in recent years, people began to also say we wanted to really increase that sovereignty and that decolonization of what it means to be on our own tribal territories and began to take back our own tribal names. And so today we call ourselves Lashon because my great grandfather, Jose Guzman, one of the last speakers of the Chochenyo language introduced himself as we are Lashon. And so our name comes from that Lashon, the San Lorenzo Creek that grows into the bay is our waterway. Our mountain is Tuyushtak, what many people think of um, now is called Mount Diablo. Our um, territory, um, because we are a confederation, are not just Ohlone. 
We are made up of five different tribes that were brought into and enslaved at Mission San Jose in Fremont. And so our territory is vast. It includes five Bay Area counties, Alameda, Contra Costa, Solano, San Joaquin, and Napa. And our people are made up of those people that came from those different tribes. And so we take our, the work that we do in our territories very seriously. And some of the work that we started to do uh, decades ago was to talk about uh, the shell mounds. Interestingly enough, we are talked about in fourth grade history. And in that fourth grade history, we're talked about in the past mostly. I remember learning about fourth grade history when I was this, as child in John Sweat School and elementary school in Oakland and learning about my ancestors that we were all gone. And I was confused as a child and went home to talk to my mother about that. Um, and no, we are still here. And um, we have always been here. The shell mounds have been a uh, important part of our history just like people from all over the world that left monuments behind, our people did the same thing here in the Bay Area. Nels Nelson in 1909 created a map that uh, actually almost pinpointed 425 shell mounds that ring the Bay Area. This map right here is, uh, shows the many shell mounds that he found in 1909. Uh, way before I was born or my, my mother was even born, that these shell mounds were designated as places of not just interest, but our cemeteries, our, our cultural spaces, the places that we had villages, the places that we had our ceremonies at. And just like people all over the world, we buried our ancestors right in the villages that we lived in, not somewhere far, far away like we do today in cemeteries, but places right where we lived. And so our ancestors were a part of our daily lives. It was during the um, 1990s uh, when there was this boom um, of the internet that was created, this mass exodus of people living in the Bay Area, this gentrification that we talk about today happened um, uh, not that long ago here in the Bay Area again. And today we see all these cranes in the skies and not birds but the ones that are building things. And as things were being built during the late 1990s, our ancestors began to reveal themselves, just as today they're revealing themselves because of all the building that's happening. We um, created an organization called Indian People Organizing for Change, and we actually walked the shell mounds, um, starting in Vallejo at the top of our territory. We walked down to San Jose and up to San Francisco, stopping at many of the shell mounds that we could find. Um, and we found ourselves standing and praying at parking lots and apartment buildings and streets and buildings of schools and uh, bars. And underneath these places, these buildings, this asphalt that was newly created was the shell mounds that were still um, partially intact that had our ancestral remains, these spiritual places that um, have kept us connected all of these years. These prayers that our ancestors put down for thousands of years for all of us now living in our territories, not just the lonely people, but everyone. You see, I think that the Bay Area is this magical place that our ancestors prayed on for thousands of years and that they put this magic in the land that creates this abundance. And we look at the Bay Area, there is this abundance that's still here. And I talk about this because I think it's true. It's not that long ago. The colonization that happened here in California was much different than happened on the East Coast. It was just a few hundred years ago that we could drink fresh water out of every creek in the Bay Area, and that there was enough food and on the lands that it sustained everyone. And so this concept of hunger and homelessness is new to our territory, but that abundance hasn't left. That abundance is still here, the abundance of ideas and minds, people coming together to create new things. There were uh, movements that were created in our territories. The Black Panther movement was here, the American Indian movement, the Brown Berets, uh, people that, were, are, that are and continue to work around uh, transgender and two-spirit movements are here in the Bay Area. And these ideas of technologies that's growing here, but also this wealth this idea of abundance here in the Bay Area. 
these shell mounds are, are important um, to us, not, not only as Ohlone people, but we hope that we share this with the people that now live in our territories. These uh, shell mounds give us a place that we are grounded into our territories through space and place beyond all time. And that our ancestors chose these places in order to put our ceremonial grounds on so that we would always be protected. You see indigenous um, spirituality is place-based. We cannot take our spirituality and go uh, to another place um, like you can take a uh, church um, or other teachings around the world, but we have to be in those particular places, laying down those particular prayers and songs at particular times of the year as our ancestors had for thousands of years. Because of the way that the education system has been throughout the uh, last 100 or so years, they have erased Ohlone people almost. We are taught about in the past, and so there is no um, imagination that we could be here in the present, that our ancestors have uh, survived many different waves of genocide um, here on the Bay Area, and that we're still here taking care of this land, quietly sometimes and loudly at other times. Um, but it's my responsibility as a grandmother to ensure that these sacred places um, continue to thrive for my grandchildren's grandchildren's grandchildren. I wanna show you because most people in the Bay Area don't know what shell mounds are like. And so I'm gonna cue John to go ahead and show this really quick video. Um, and, and then we're gonna um, turn it over to Yuki who we have had uh, the lovely pleasure of working with. The city of Berkeley started on the shores of what we now call the San Francisco Bay. Before the university, before California cuisine, before landfills and parking lots, my people settled here in Huchin. More than 5,000 years ago, my Ohlone ancestors built the first fishing village on the bay. At the heart of it was a freshwater creek and two massive shell mounds. Archaeologists officially recorded a boundary for the site in 2003 making it eligible for the National Register of Historic Places. After the gold rush, the Spanger family built a restaurant and Strawberry Creek flowed right through their grotto. The shell mounds were scraped away to fertilize farm fields and pave city streets. In 1907, the site was studied and mapped by archeologist Nels Nelson. It was landmarked by the city of Berkeley in 2000. Today, the heart of our ancient village is threatened by a five-story retail and condo project. But we have a different vision for the best use of this land, a green space and a cultural park. In this one area left unbuilt, a 2.2 acre parking lot known as 1900 Fourth Street, my people still go to remember our ancestors with prayer and ceremony. This is where people lived and died, laughed and cried, and buried our ancestors in the shell mounds. Aluni people are still here, and we have a vision for this sacred site, not for the commercial development being proposed, but a green space with flowing water, a memorial park where we can rebury our ancestors who were taken away to museums, a place for reflection and ceremony for all. On the top, my people could see fires built on shell mounds across the bay. This is where we sang the old one spirits out through the western gate. This is the birthplace of Berkeley. Thank you so much. I'm gonna um, ask Michelle to join us, um, sorry, uh, to talk about her um, part in bringing together this beautiful vision of Oakway Park. Thank you, Michelle. Greetings, everyone. 
I'm Michelle Seville, and I was the former arts and culture manager for the city of Richmond. And part of the responsibility of that job entails putting out calls for art, for public art. We have an ordinance there that enables 1.5% of any capital improvement project to go to art. So when I heard in 2015 that a shell mound had been discovered uh, at the site where they were constructing the Officer Bradley Moody Memorial Underpass, I was shocked. Um, they ex excavated down underneath so that they could create a roadway and have the trains pass overhead because the trains were holding up traffic. But I, I had no idea that there were shell mounts there and I didn't know if anyone else did either. So what I had to find out was had local tribal members been contacted? Did they know about this discovery? Had city of Richmond reached out to them per California law uh, to let them know that um, this discovery had been made. You can go to the next slide. And I decided that it was important to reach out and, and make contact. So I began efforts to contact uh, Karina Gold among others. And it took a while to get through, but the main thing in my mind was this had to go differently. We couldn't just put out a call for art and expect people to apply. This was sacred territory. And if this ground, if this land could speak, what would, what would be said? And I decided that the best way to find that out was to contact the Ohlone tribal members and see what they had to say. So when I heard back from Karina, I shared my idea with her. And I said, this was Ohlone land to begin with. It still is. And the way that any public art should go is to honor who lived here for thousands of years. And Karina got back to me and said that she agreed. She thought that was uh, the correct way to move forward. And I did learn that some of the remains were returned to the Ohlone tribe. And so this was the next step. And we began the beginning of a wonderful collaboration. The next step for the public art though, was to share the idea with Richmond's Public Art Advisory Committee and they would be overseeing the project. So they too were in total agreement and I asked them to begin to search for public artists who had worked with um, sites featuring Native American themes or subject matter, any, anything that would give them um, some kind of insight for how to work with this project. And we did a small call for artists because we only found a few, a few of them who had proposals, had done proposals in the past. This is the site where the park was constructed. And this is what it looked like before. So when we invited the artists to come, there were only four of them. And most of them came with proposals. Only one artist did not. And that was Yuki Nagase. He had no proposal. And he told us, this isn't how I work. Instead, he shared beautiful slides of granite sculptures he had created over a period of summers with the Lakota tribe. He explained how we met with them many times to hear their stories and see their tribal images. Then he created designs based on those meetings and tribal members reviewed what he submitted and some of the ideas were tweaked 
And then the final proposal was again presented to the tribal members for final approval. The Public Art Advisory Committee selected Yuki for the Richmond based project based on his extraordinary artwork and on the collaborative method he used with the Lakota tribe. That's the method we wanted to use in Richmond. And from that point on, those involved in the project visited the site and talked about what would follow. Yuki and his wife, Michelle, would meet many times with Karina and other tribal members to discuss the images that would be used in the stone carvings, the plan for the layout of the park surrounding it, and the landscaping, which would include indigenous plants and trees traditionally used by Ohlone people. The landscaping was a whole separate issue. We wanted the care and maintenance of the park to be done by tribal members who also wanted to hold tribal gatherings there and have educational presentations about the medicinal plants that were going to be planted. They needed ownership of the site. Next, we wanted the naming of the park to be done by tribal members. So we worked together to find out how to get around the existing rules and policies and procedures of the city to make our vision happen. The city's parks department was very helpful. Even city council agreed. The creation of Oakway Park and the beautiful public art that was designed for it represents what I believe is the appropriate way to go about creating public art on shell mounds or near them or other tribal land. While we cannot change what happened on this land in the past, we can certainly change how it is used today. And we can represent and engage with the tribes who originally lived here. In this way, we can affect the present and future of public art, which is one of the most powerful vehicles for community and artistic expression. We think that ours is a great model and the work on Ukwe Park was a healing process for everyone. And the result was the first public art project in Richmond recognizing the legacy of the Ohlone tribe in this region. We are proud of it and we hope that you will come and visit. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Masayuki Nagase. I'm an artist for this project. When I learned about this public art project, it was very clear that I needed to start with Ornone community. I felt it was essential to have an open mind. This was why I did not bring any plans or concrete proposal to the selection committee. My approach for this project was to engage the Olone community directly and to listen to them. I wanted to collaborate with them to create a vision for this artwork together and have it reflect their voices. I met with Corina and her daughter Deja and Olone elders, Ruth and Ramona. I listened to Ruth's personal experience of being Olone in the Bay Area, what her community went through to survive. We met multiple times and discussed the important present day issues for the preservation of shell mounds and the work of Sogoreate Land Trust. I shared with them how I work with the theme of nature. I asked them to share 
how they felt personally connected to the nature. As a part of my research, I went to Orone, Miwok, village sites in the region. This is Chitaktak Adams Heritage County Park in the South Bay near Morgan Hill. This image shows Indian Grinding Rock State Historic Park near Jacksonville. This site has the largest collection of bedrock mortar holes in North America. They are used to grind acorns as a staple of their diet from the many surrounding barley oak trees. This is Coyote Hills Regional Park in Fremont where there is a 2000 year old Sherman site. At each place I visited, I felt the indigenous people's life and their deep connection to nature, how their lives evolved in the beautiful natural landscape. I pictured the abundance of natural life before European colonizers arrived. I felt their life was embraced with nature. Each place where they lived had a creek or mushroom. I imagined how all of these creeks were filled with fish, salmon, such an abundance of life, migrating birds covering the sky and tremendous elk cars covered the land as far as you could see. This is the Barclay Marina, Cedar Chavez Park, where I walk every day. This shoreline and the bay was the home of the Orone for thousands of years. This same bay was filled with fish and seals so much that the boat could not go through. I felt the deep harmony of indigenous people and the nature living together in balance. This is a map I saw at Corina's Soleate Land Trust office in Oakland. I was surprised that so many creeks existed here and that I don't see them anymore in this way. And at each of these creeks, the Orone tribe lived and thrived here for thousands of years. All of these images I showed before are a part of the inspiration for this art project. The challenge of this site for me was to bring life back to this place, to bring a sense of renewal and to reclaim the sacredness to this land, to the Sherman and to the ancestors who are in this earth right here. I wanted to create a whole environmental artwork that used the entire site instead of a single monument or sculpture. I saw this as an opportunity to collaborate with all on the community and to find ways they could use this land tended and having a living relationship with this artwork. For ceremony, to have a community gatherings, for growing native plants and trees and to honor their ancestors. The main design element is a walkway that is inspired by the image of creek with a series of natural granite borders and the native planting beds. Next this slide. next slide. Bro? Next slide. This panorama shows results of our collaboration, bringing life and new energy to this land and to honor the Sherman and the Orone tribe. Our collaborative design expresses their deep connection with nature, 
and the sacredness of Shilma and the all on the way of life from the past to the present. The design concepts for the series of borders composition are based on the three natural elements, water, and earth. I think just say next. And wind. So this series of hand-carved borders reflect our collaborative vision and expresses the close relationship between the Orone and the natural world. We chose together meaningful natural elements to integrate into the artwork. This is one of the largest borders and it expresses Orone's connection to the water and to the bay. This design is based on the form of an abalone shell. Corina, can you please share the importance of abalone? Thank you, Yuki. Uh, wow, I'm, I'm blown away by the, thank you for this presentation. Um, for you on the audience, I'm, this is the first time I'm watching the presentation with Yuki talking about this and it, it really brings uh, tears to my eyes the uh, amount of beauty and the uh, integrity that Yuki has brought to bringing this alive for all of us. The abalone shell is a, it's a beautiful relative who uh, gives us uh, so much life, right? We eat the relative that lives in the abalone shell, but the abalone shell uh, represents so much for us. Uh, for us, it's the it's a part of something that we use still today. I have earrings on today that have abalone in them. Um, California native people use abalone because we have this relationship. As women, we uh, realize that the abalone shell also um, holds uh, power of the, of the ocean and the bay and that the, um, it's connected with our moon in the sky that um, determines the tidal waves um, in and out of the ocean and the bay, but also the time of uh, the seasons of a woman's body um, as she goes through the month cycles. It's a way that we've traded with tribal people across the world, across the country. We know that old, old pieces of abalone are found in the middle of the country um, where there is no ocean. And so it could have only gotten there by human steps. Um, and so it's, um, it's a part of us. It continues to be a part of us in our life today. We use it to hold our medicines, to burn in. We use it to, uh, to, uh, to, to do many different things, but um, abalone continues to be an important source for California native people and for the Lashan people. Thank you. So this is designed is based on two uh, type of reed. Uh, Corina, again, can you please share the use of tool? We call it tuli. We say the e at the end. Right. Uh huh. Um, and tuli is a marsh um, uh, reed that grows in the marsh and the in the waters, and it does a lot. It actually filters water and it helps to clean the waters. And it was a part of who we were intricately um, with the land as many indigenous people across the world. We lived in reciprocity with the land and used the, those things that were around us. And so today we talk about leaving a smaller footprint on the earth as human beings, as we look at climate crisis and disaster. And our ancestors did that just a few hundred years ago. We use Thule as a material to create our homes 
that kept them warm during the winter and very cool during the summertime. We use tulies as mats to sleep on because they're squishy. We bundled them together and made our, our canoes that went on the bay and our creeks um, and went fishing. And so we were fishermen in our bays. We used them to make baskets uh, to hold materials in and so um, and shade structures. And so Thule was instrumental in our day-to-day -day life. It was a part of who we were. Um, and some people say we sometimes are even the color of Thule. And so we blend into those those surroundings that we are part of the land, not um, we are from it, not away from it. Thank you. So this is designed based on a few types of shells found in the shell mounds. So this is a, a drawing, my design for one of the largest borders representing earth. The design is based on the image of an oak tree. I carved the mortar holes in the design based on the traditional bedrock mortars used by Oronde for grinding acorns. Here is a mortar and pestle as reference. This border sculpture can be used also as a ceremonial table and the mortars are functional and it can be used for educational demonstrations. The image of acorns. This shows the drawing layout on the third largest border that represents wind. And this is a finished relief on border. These borders continue with the theme of wind. This design based on the hawk and raven. This is based on winged insects, such as bees and butterflies. This one is based on waves and showbirds. This border is carved with the title of artwork. I talked to the Corina and Deja to create the title and Deja translated in the Chochenyo language. This translate as water is life. We are still here. Corina, uh, can you please share my, uh, why you chose we are still here? Oh, thank you, Ki. If Deja's on, I'd love for her to talk. Deja is the language carrier for our tribe and is reawakening the language of her great great grandfather. Um, if Deja's on, could Deja talk to this one a little bit? Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, yes. Uh, my name. Um, and I just want to say that, um, yeah, that I'm very um, honored to have been able to work with you and have much respect for you the way that you um, have, have uh, shown respect for us. Um, am I echoing? Yeah, you're breaking up. You are a bit, yeah, just a bit breaking up. Just a second. 
Okay, hello? Oh, yeah, no. Okay. So I just want to share my gratitude for Yuki and Michelle and uh, the much respect that I have for both of you. Um, yes. Um, so um, the translation uh, for water is life is si uti isha. Um, and that is water is life. Um, the next one is ehemete mak, which means um, we are still here. Um, and I think uh, my mom explained a, a lot earlier about um, us being uh, talked about in the, um, in the past tense instead of the present tense. Um, and so that was my idea of that um, translation there is to let it know that we are here. Um, we, are past. we are here in the present and we are, will be in the future. Thank you. Yeah, Corina, uh, what do you think? Can you please talk about your experience of this collaboration on this artwork and the creation of this park? Yeah, I, um, and if Deja or, or my daughter Cheyenne wanna jump in, that would be great about this. You know, this is a part of, um, you know, one of my grandchildren is here running in the park. It's been a amazing uh, experience to work with uh, Yuki in, um, in watching this dream come to reality and to, you know, really thank Michelle um, Seville and the Arts um, Commission for putting this, to, putting us together. I know it was really, really, um, hard to get a hold of us for a while. And Yuki was so patient with setting up times to come and meet with us and to really come and figure out what it was that we wanted to say and how we could say it and to bring this together. But um, to have my family and the tribal members coming out to this land right now, to reclaim it as uh, a part of who we are again, to be the caretakers of this land again in the way that we are supposed to live in reciprocity um, to share that with the public, but also with our young ones and our elders in creating places where we create medicine, which is what Oakway means. And, um, and to see the kids to engaging is absolutely um, a, a beautiful thing. Thank you. It's like a dream come true. These are some of the grandbabies. So future LaShawn folks are here. Um, and, you know, they are there every, uh, at least every week or every other week with their moms tending to the land and the plants, um, putting their hands on the ground and climbing all over these beautiful structures that these beautiful boulders and pieces of art that Yuki created. And, um, and it, you know, it really does something different when the kids feel really grounded in who they are and where they come from and being a part of, a, uh, of the land. Even though I grew up here in the East Bay, my entire life I was born here, our people have never been um, separated from our land. It uh, gives you a different sense of belonging again and who you are and being seen. And it gives you a, a way of, of holding yourself in this world again the way our ancestors have always wanted us to do that. And I can see that um, in, the, in my kids, but I could also see it in my grandchildren, the way that they glow when they're a part of these lands that we have begun to reclaim. So part of our collaborative design concept was to have native plants and the trees planted here that the Orone could harvest and use. I worked with Deja to select all of the native plants that can be used for ceremony and traditional uses. The city of Richmond also invited the Orone community to name the park. Yeah, Corina, uh, can you please share the meaning of the park's name? Yeah, Deja, again, she was our language carrier. So she came up with the name and 
I think when we were sitting there um, with Yuki, we began to talk about what could it be like if we were able to actually tend to the lands, not just uh, to go and visit like everyone else, but that the tribe could actually participate in re-engaging with the land in a different kind of a way, a way for us to grow medicinal plants that we could use in our day-to-day -day life that we can share with the public through different ways of being there that, uh, that we could bring back these uh, uh, continuous uh, relationships with our plant relatives. And um, so it's called Ukwe, uh, Ukwe, Ukwe Park and Ukwe means medicine. And it's medicine in so many different ways, not just the plants, but it's medicines for our souls, our spirits. It's medicines that um, allow us to come together in laughter and in tears of joy and of sorrow. And it uh, does all of these different things. So Okwe as medicine, when we think of medicine, we don't think of it just as something that, uh, that you take by mouth, but that we take in by all of our senses. And um, I believe that that's, it's a beautiful name for this particular place um, that needs healing also as our ancestors were taken out of this land in order to create something different that they were disturbed, but that by creating this medicine park, Oakway Park, that it creates a healing for us and our ancestors in this particular way. Thank you. So, um, Corina Odeja, uh, can you please talk about these native plants, their traditional uses or anything you think? Deja? This is Dog Bane, I think. Hi, yes, yeah, so sorry. Um, my kids just came in. <laughs> okay, um, yes. Um, this one's white, say, oh, okay, uh, Dog Bane. Um, dog Bane is a, a plant that, um, that we asked to be at this site because Dog Bane is something that um, we use um, we use um, to actually make uh, cordage um, out of, um, which is like um, like a stringy material to like make um, rope kind of. Um, and it's it's something that's traditionally used by not only us by by many California natives um, to do those types of things. So we wanted to bring that back into our territory. Um, yerba buena is this one here. Um, it's something that is used for tea. Um, it's in the mint family. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's used mostly for tea. Sorry, um, the kids are coming in now. Yerba Buena is also the name of the island that you know that's in between San Francisco and the Bay, uh, because there was multiple, there was lots of Yerba Buena that was growing there, and so our people have always used it as a tea to help our stomachs and to um, to calm down. And so it's a it's a beautiful tea that we continue to use today. And this is elderberry. Um, which is a beautiful medicinal plant that we use for um, the, you cannot actually eat the berries when they're by themselves. You have to actually process them. Many um, people will know that there is now elderberry syrup and it's really good on pancakes, but there's also a tincture that you can make that actually helps you your, to boost your immunity during cold and flu season. And so it's really good to process it in those kinds of ways. So. Deja um, ha and uh, tribal members and people at Segorite Land Trust have been doing that for the last few seasons um, to do that kind of work uh, there. This is a sage, a different kind of a sage here that's grown. Oh, no, oh, this, isn't. this is chia. No. This is California chia. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there you are. I was just filling in for you, Deja. Go ahead. Sorry. I would also like to um, also say that elderberry, we, um, we use the branches to make our instruments, our clapper sticks. Um, so it's very um, important to us in that way. 
two. Um, California Chia. Um, it is so cute. Um, <laughs> there are so many sprouting up over at Oakway now. Um, we really wanted to have California Chia, um, but also it is one of our traditional foods. Most of the Chia that is bought in stores now is actually imported from Mexico. And so we wanted to make sure that we had our traditional foods in our traditional territory so that we will be able to, to eat and uh, utilize that. These are um, wild strawberries. Um, our strawberries are smaller than the strawberries that you see in the stores, um, but it's also one of our traditional and sacred foods that we eat uh, once a year during strawberry season. It's, um, and we wanted to make sure that we have that for our tribal members um, um, since it's not sold in stores. Okay. This is Angelica root and, uh, or Angelica. Um, we mostly use the root even though the stalk um, and the leaves can be eaten. We mostly use the root for um, medicinal purposes and um, burning for medicine. The root is used, um, can be used in teas, can be burned, it can be chewed on when like um, babies are teething um, and things like that. Um, yes. And then the next one is, sorry, there's like, there's uh, quite a few plants over there and <laughs> I know we're on the time uh, schedule. This is manzanita, uh, next one, manzanita. Um, manzanita is used, uh, this one's angelica still. So the next one is manzanita, there we go, manzanita. Manzanita has berries that um, grow on it and the berries can be used as a tea also. Um, and then not only that, but the branches can be used to um, create um, baskets. Um, this one is, uh, um, I have, it's funny because I had forgotten that there were two, because um, not on the beds. Oh, is this one about that? One of the black oak? Black oak, yep. Um, Black Oak, because we wanted the representation of us there, um, because we um, have, we have like, um, have and have had an abundance of acorn growing um, in our territory. And it is one of our, um, our main food sources is acorn, um, because we can gather a lot of it and eat it all year round. Um, so we wanted that representation there. Um, at the park. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. So this is the educational signage we set in the place. We hope that the future of this park can be developed into an educational site about the Orone tribe. I hope this public art project will continue to be an open ongoing collaboration between the Orone community and the city of Richmond. Here is Ruth, the respected Orone elder, and Corina. And here is the next generation, Corina, the young, youngest granddaughter. <laughs> Thank you for listening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yuki. That was an amazing um, presentation, um, and I'm so I'm still so in awe with this collaboration that we were able to do. You know, Yuki was so kind. When we were first talking about plants, uh, he found out that we couldn't actually grow the plants in the ground. And so he came up with this idea of planting things above ground so that we could actually use the medicinal um, plants that were there, the strawberries and um, other, the chia and stuff so that we wouldn't um, poison ourselves eating it here in the Bay Area now. Um, you know, I think of this, 
this wonderful connection between uh, California Native people and our Japanese relatives and um, and the beauty of, of the struggles that we've both sur uh, survived over time. You know, our, our Japanese relatives were interned here in our California native lands uh, when this government um, decided to, uh, to go against them. Just like we were sought out and killed um, for being on our own territories and our, as uh, people here in California, Japanese people were also in that way um, oppressed. And so, I think it's a beautiful way that California Native people and Japanese uh, uh, people came together to create this healing park, this park that really talks to um, to coming back to the land in a different kind of way, to remembering our ancestors and who we are as human beings, and to be, be um, beyond uh, our our pain and to look towards healing. And so, thank you, Yuki, for this opportunity. Um, I bow to your ancestors, I bow to you um, for this amazing work and journey that we've been on and that uh, it will forever um, connect us um, to each other. Um, I'm supposed to talk about the preservation of shell mounts now. And um, when we look at the landscape of the Bay Area, uh, most of our, our land is uh, built upon. It's got asphalt and buildings and streets and uh, cement on top of it. And yet, um, and so many people that come to our territories can't imagine a landscape that doesn't have these things here. But we have to realize that it's only a few hundred years ago, a few hundred years that any of this stuff was built here. You know, the state of California is very young and it was only created as a state in 1850. Um, after uh, people were crazy hungry for this thing called gold that for thousands of years had been left in the ground by uh, California native people. And so I always think about how it is that our ancestors put these places down. I'm so blessed that we are here connected to our land and that we have never left. We have an unbroken tie for thousands of years on our territories. And I imagine um, going back a, a few thousand years on a timeline today, I was like, if we went back all the way to as far as we could imagine on a timeline, that that timeline would go on and on and on. And that the period of time from colonization to now would only be about this much, right? Very tiny amount. And I thought about my Aboriginal brothers and sisters who live in Australia, and the thousands and thousands of years and since first contact, this little tiny dot on this timeline, that, this, that things have changed. So we know as human beings that things can uh, change drastically in a short amount of time, but that we can also have the ability to change things to moving forward. And so the shell mound preservation and protection is about that. It's about remembering and it's about perseverance it's about sovereignty, and it's about, uh, it's about inclusivity. And the video that we watched about the West Berkeley Shell Mound is about all of those things. You see of the 425 shell mounds that used to ring the Bay Area, the West Berkeley Shell Mound is the oldest of all of them. It was the very first place that my ancestors decided to make their, their village site and shell mounds right there along the bay. Our, our shell mounds are always connected by fresh water to the bay. So close to marshlands and to where our creeks went into there. So there was this abundance of tule there and this abundance of birds and abundance of fish and shells, shellfish that was there. And so I can imagine when I go to the West Berkeley shell mound today and it's covered with asphalt, but it doesn't make it any less sacred. It doesn't make it any less important to us and for the last five years, we have been fighting to preserve and protect that sacred site. That sacred site is our, our, one of our beginnings, one of our creation stories about being there. It's about how we connect from that shell mound to an island called Alcatraz where our ancestors would rest for four days waiting while we had ceremony and where they would, their, their spirits would leave this place on the evening of the fourth day and go through our Western gate where, this, where the Golden Gate Bridge is today. 
You see, so that's place-based and we can't move that sacred site someplace else. That, that sacred site is a part of who we are and where we're supposed to be. It's a way that we connect ourselves to this land, um, the land that we have always been a part of. And so we have been blessed to over, you know, over many years, but the last five years specifically to protect that West Berkeley shell mound from development, as you saw inside of the, um, the video that uh, Toby McLeod was so beautifully put together with Chris Walker and Jessica Abbey. They were able to help us to, in a short, very short video to explain what that place was. And I hope that you guys understand it. But over the last five years, besides being in court, we have had thousands of people from all over the world that have come and prayed with us there. People from all denominations, people from all religious sects, people from all backgrounds have intersected at this West Berkeley Shell Mount and have come and prayed for that place to be protected and saved. The sacredness that is underneath the asphalt that connects us as human beings to being human beings again to that Strawberry Creek where the water should flow into the bay, where our children should be able to play in that water again, where we should be able to bring our salmon back home. It connects us to our Winnemum Wintu relatives that are up in Shasta, who are also not federally recognized, but are speaking for the salmon. It allows us to do ceremony with them and connect our waterways to uh, their waterways, their river to our Delta and our Bay. The Shell Mound is a place where people um, from all places have come and laid down their prayers. It's a place that if you sit on that asphalt, you can still hear the ancestors' children laughing. You can almost smell the fires of food cooking at night. And so this asphalt that we put on top of this earth that is still breathing, still has soul, it still has memory, and it still calls us back home. And so the shell mounds were really the work that we did in the early years of Indian people organizing for change that created this work called the Segorite Land Trust, the first urban indigenous women-led land trust in the country. It was a way for us to begin to think about our ancestors who are imprisoned in, in universities and institutions around the Bay Area. In Berkeley alone, they hold 9,000 of our ancestral remains and, and more, thousands of more of our funerary objects that should be back in the ground. There's nobody that should be studied in a museum, let alone 9,000 of our ancestors there. And that's just one institution. Our prayer as we did a walks around the Bay Area was to bring those ancestors home. But because we are a non-federally recognized tribe, we have no land base. We have no place to put our ancestors. Where do you even begin to think about putting 9,000 ancestors back into the ground when you are homeless in your own homeland? And so as we begin that prayer and we stood our ground to preserve, preserve and protect two shell mounds, on the Carquinez Strait in 2011. We decided that uh, we got a phone call six months after um, that four month, four and a half month um, occupation of our sacred site in Vallejo called Segorite. Segorite is the name of that, uh, that village site on the Carquinez Strait, that place where our ancestors had been for thousands of years one of the last strongholds before our ancestors was taken into the missions was right there on that strait. The story of our ancestors uh, running and hiding um, and getting away from Spanish soldiers is written in diaries when they come to that strait that they lost my ancestors, but they came during a run of salmon. And in that time, they wrote that there were so many salmon going through that waterway that you can practically walk on their backs to get to the other side. In our lifetime, we have never saw such a miracle. And yet my ancestors did for thousands and thousands of years from living in reciprocity. And so now it's our time. It's our time as human beings to remember those, those stories that were left for us, even if they were scary stories and diaries of our ancestors being chased, that those stories also tell us that there's resiliency in the way that we lived our lives, and that it's our responsibility to talk to people now living in our territories about how to live their lives 
in such a way that we can bring that abundance back in a different kind of way, that we could live our lives in that kind of way. So the Segorite Land Trust was, yes, it was created to bring our ancestors home, but it was also a way to bring us back home as indigenous people that live in our territory and have an unbroken tie, but not just for us, also for other indigenous people that were moved here on forced relocation policies during the 50s and um, the 50s and 60s into our territories that have now sometimes three generations of people that have never gone home, that they have to have a place to have ceremony, a place to grow their own foods and medicines, a place for them to connect to, to, to place and space again, but not just them. People live in our territory and they're not going home. And so how do we begin to live in reciprocity with one another and with the lands and waterways on which we live? How do we begin to do that for the next seven generations and beyond? We talk about this abundance here in the Bay Area, but there is this abundance of minds and ideas and ways of being on this land and in these waterways. We know already that we have the technology to clean up our waters, a way for us to clean up our lands, a way for us to fight to keep the oils in the grounds and to stop pipelines from going through our waterways. We know as human beings that this is the time for us to do that. And Segorite Land Trust is about that kind of work. It's an urban indigenous women-led land trust because rematriation is indigenous women-led work. It's in indigenous women's work to do rematriation. We're not talking about repatriation. We're talking about this connection of land of bringing back and bringing forward those, cer those ceremonial songs, those ceremonial ways, those dances, that language of the land that does not sound like English. We're turning back those prayers for everybody that now lives here to live in reciprocity with taking care of this place we call home now. So we created this women-led land trust, indigenous women-led land trust for that, to bring it back into balance. As we know that men have been in charge of land for many hundreds of years. And we look across the world and we see what has happened to the land and how that, has, that correlates what has happened to women across the world, the sacredness being taken first, the raping and extraction, and then this has to stop, that it's time for us to come back into balance with this earth, that it's time for us to take our rightful place as indigenous women to talk about how we come back into balance, not to leave our men behind because I have sons and grandsons, I have nieces and nephews, that need to come back, our uncles that need to come back because at the time of colonization, that sacred responsibilities of theirs was taken from them as well. We need to look at this and how do we look at our relatives that are fighting in different places for sovereignty and for, we look at our friends and our relatives in Palestine, our friends and relatives in Kashmir and West Papua, our, our relatives that are standing against oil and all kinds of things that are, are killing the Amazon, our lungs of this earth, and know that we also must stand in relationship with all of them. We stand in relationship with our sacred places that are being destroyed in Hawaii, Mauna Kea, the Oak Flats, Bears Ears. We stand in relationship with all of our relatives that are doing this work as well. The Segorite Land Trust is about rematriation in all its different forms about replacing uh, this idea of um, having more, but sharing the abundance as indigenous um, epistemologies tells us that the way to feel rich and to be rich is to give it away. In order for us to bring stuff back into balance, we need to make sure that everyone has the, everything they need in order to live on this earth in a good way. And that's what the Segorite Land Trust is about. It's about really putting indigenous land back into indigenous hands, not so that we can hoard it away, but so that we can share it, share the wealth of knowledge and to learn to live in laughter and reciprocity with one another again. And so I, um, I offer you this, this, if you live in uh, our lands in the East Bay, Segorite Land Trust, look up our website. Um, if you live and play in, um, in and, uh, work in our lands. Uh, we have the opportunity to engage in, in paying shumi, and shumi in our language means a gift. It means that you can help us to do this work of rematriation. When we get out of this thing called COVID, 
we offer you to come to the lands that we're taking care of and help us to do that. Help us to pull weeds and to plant trees and to, uh, to harvest foods and to take care of one another and to do the work of um, taking care of the sacred. And when time comes for us to stand against bulldozers, if it takes it, and we ask you to stand with us to protect our sacred site at the West Berkeley Shell Mound. We uh, won the first court case and we lost the second court case and we were denied access to the California Supreme Court. And we, um, we are looking, we have not lost. We have not given up. We are still here and our ancestors have given us a sacred responsibility to take care of these lands and taking care of the West Berkeley Shell Mound. Um, I, um, I honor all of those that have stood with us and continue to stand with us to take care of this sacred site. And so um, we will be putting out information soon about what our next steps are. I uh, just wanna thank you so much for allowing me to talk. Um, I'm over my time, so I'm gonna stop right now. You could talk all night as far as I'm concerned, Karina. I think we all learned so much and we're so honored to hear your stories. Um, I, uh, I encourage people, we put the, um, the, the links in, in the chat box and please sign up for updates because I think we all wanna be out there with you to fight for, for Berkeley. That the plans that I've seen are, are quite stunning. I really hope they can manifest. I'm gonna pray they manifest. Um, a few questions and um, one thing you touched on uh, is about uh, the Ohlone, uh, local Ohlone not being federally recognized. So someone is asking why not? And if you, uh, another part of that is what does Ohlone mean? Can you tell us um, why not recognized? Sure, so let's go a little bit back in history. So there were 21 missions that were created from the bottom of California all the way up to Sonoma. Virtually no tribes along the coast of California are uh, federally recognized. And so we can begin to guess why federal government wouldn't want to recognize California Indians when this is the richest uh, land in the, um, in the country, practically along the coastlines of California. We, um, um, there were some really horrible things that were done by anthropologists and archaeologists early on. Um, people like Heiser, um, who said that we were extinct for all intents and purposes. Um, the United States government stopped having government to government relationships with us because of those um, writings. The Bureau of Indian Affairs um, wrote something similar during a time in the 1920s when we were still having relationships with the federal government. Um, and so we were not ever non -federal, not federally recognized. They just stopped having those conversations. So it's a longer conversation about how those things happen. Ohlone, like I said earlier, is a um, generic term. Um, there are multiple tribes in every area um, that we are in. In the East Bay, there are at least five different tribes, uh, or four different tribes in the East Bay. There was never one overarching tribe in Ohlone territory. There are actually eight different languages in Ohlone territory, um, starting up with Karkin on the Karkin on the on the Karkina Strait, Chochenyo, Mutsin, Ramatush, Ashwaswas, um, Shalone, um, Tamian. So there were very many different people that spoke different languages, had different uh, creation stories, had different things. So that's one of the things that we have to get out of this myth and this idea that we were all the same. Even if we're under this, this uh, misnomer of Ohlone, we're trying to get away from that. And so we are Lashan. Other tribes call themselves other things, um, but um, we were never one overarching tribe. And so we took care of the land um, with, tri uh, with tribes, smaller tribes within territories, um, and sometimes the same territories where we traded and uh, shared uh, land, land bases and waterways with. Mm. Beautiful, thank you, thank you. I'd like to uh, turn a question to, to um, well, actually, to all of you, this is from our beloved Malcolm Margolin. And uh, he says, this is such a wonderful project. Are there any plans for doing a book? You know, he's a publisher and or a documentary video. I beg for something first rate. 
We can do one. <laughs> Any plan? Uh, I could I could speak to that a little bit. Um, sometimes the city of Richmond has done a book uh, in tandem with past public art. Um, there was not enough in the budget for this project to do that. Um, and, and so I doubt that it would be forthcoming from the city of Richmond, but I think it's a, a wonderful idea. And I think it's very uh, important to do. We'll keep that in mind, do some fundraising. <laughs> um, and Malcolm, you can step up and do it for us. Hmm. So uh, Yuki, someone's asking, you know, obviously people are going to climb all over the, the sculptures and wondering, this person's wondering, can you share how that was included in the design and, and working of the park? Oh, I always work, you know, public art, just with my imagination, people come and the touch and enjoy, you know, this interaction, which doesn't happen in the museum and the galleries. And uh, so I always plan that. And my medium is mainly stone and it's, you know, with sand, any impact or, you know, I don't worry about how this changes. So this is my pleasure to have people come and really climb on the top and enjoy this, in, you know, uh, tactile experience. That's great. Yes, it was. I went to the park with Yuki, and it was wonderful to be able to touch them because I can't touch anything in our museum. <laughs> um, so uh, this, uh, Karina, this is from a teacher who teaches fifth grade in the San Leandro School District, and they're rewriting their elementary history curriculum in order to reflect and include Indigenous people's history and movements. And they were wondering if it's possible to arrange school visits to the shell mounds. Um, I, I, that's one question and they want, so students can learn about the sacred Ohlone sites along with ways in which we can support Ohlone people today. And I think the support we've been putting, you know, in the wind, in the chat, but do you have more ways they can participate and support you? Yeah, thank you so much. I would love to have young people involved um, to come and, and see where um, not only watch the shell mound, but we have a couple of different sites that the Segorite Land Trust is taking care of. We have uh, gardens that are in West Oakland and in Albany, and we're hoping to do a lot of work with the city of San Leandro around curriculum creation and stuff on the marina. And so look forward to that um, out there in San Leandro. We're really looking forward to that kind of stuff. And if you, um, you can uh, write info at rematriatetheland.org and you can um, ask for presentations. Uh, Deja um, sometimes does presentations for middle uh, for um, elementary school students. There is um, a curriculum that was developed by East Bay Regional Park District uh, for second and third graders. That's yeah, that's available online. Um, that talks about Ohlone and Bay Walk history. Um, that you could probably use some of that information as well. Um, and uh, there is. And the first Sunday of October at Coyote Hills, there is um, mostly something called um, the, an Ohlone gathering. And that's been going on for at least, I think, 40 years, 30 or 40 years. Um, and so there are lots of demonstrations, ways to interact, um, and then going on walks to um, the village sites there. Great. Uh, some questions about the plants. I have uh, three questions about the plants. One is, would there be opportunities for guests to learn more about indigenous plants and what appropriate offerings and protocols could be available for us to, uh, to us and um, to use and honor our Ohlone people, I think is the question. But then another part of this, they somebody wanted to know why the plants couldn't be in, in the ground because of the, you know, the toxins, if you could answer that. And then a third part is what appropriate native plant offerings to pray for liberation of the shell mounds and to 
present, oh, to have in honor of Ohlone people. So that's kind of a three-parter of the plants. Yuki, could you talk to the, the stuff that was in the ground? I think that you know more about that. And then Deja and I might be able to play off of the other two questions. How's that? You mean the plants we, why we planted in the ground? Uh, the oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, one reason why we set up those planters, planter boxes, because uh, we heard about the uh, land was kind of a uh, part mixed landfill. It's, it has toxin inside and the possibility, you know, is harmful if we uh, harvest plants from there. So that's why we raise the plant bed and put, you know, clean uh, soil inside. And I could add one thing to that. Um, the location of Oakway Park is near one of the shipyards that was used during World War II. And there was so much toxic waste around the shipyards uh, that took years and years to clean up. It is by no means completely cleaned, uh, but that's, that site um, had a lot of toxins. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Yuki. It, I, it, I say it's quite jarring to go to that beautiful park. And, and when you turn around, there's the pg and &E storage site. It, it, it rattled me. I, I couldn't um, handle it. So I can see why it would be toxic. Deja, do you want to jump in, uh, Cheyenne, about the plants? Yeah, um, I'm sorry. Hold on. Let me... What was the first part of that question again? I'm sorry. So one is, um, one person wanted to know about opportunities for people to learn more about indigenous plants, oh, okay. what appropriate offerings and protocols <clears throat> to honor Ohlone people. I got it. Okay, thank you. Um, yes. Um, um, yeah, so one of our intentions for the park is to actually have live demonstrations there of how you use the plants at some point. Obviously, we're in COVID times right now, so that's going to be pretty difficult. Um, but that is one of our, our intentions in the future for that park um, at some point. Um, <clears throat> Um, as far as offerings, I'm not sure if like you are talking about offering the actual plants to us or if you're planning to offer them to the um, ancestors. Um, but I know that um, if I would like, <clears throat> um, we have had um, folks who, um, who have grown some of our traditional medicines as far as something like white sage, um, any of the plants that we've talked about here on the um, on this webinar um, and allowing us to harvest those plants is um, a beautiful way to, um, um, as protocol to, um, to help us with just um, revitalizing our culture and our medicinal needs. Um, and then was there another part of the question? I'm sorry. Somebody wanted to pray for liberation of the shoal mounds and honor mm -hmm. what are appropriate native plant offerings. And you've kind of answered a bit, but if there are more. I would also like to say that as far as that, and if you were to be praying yourself, praying with your own traditional medicines Mommy. is perfectly fine. <clears throat> um, and Mommy, we are <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, we always encourage folks to, if, um, you know, if you can, even if you live in our territories is to also look back and find your roots and, um, you can bring your medicines to, to us and help us learn like you're learning from us. Mm. Thank you, Deja. Um, somebody asked about um, the, um, and this is for um, Yuki, could you share the commonalities or differences in working with the Lakota or Lijan people on community spaces? Well, uh, 
when I worked in South Dakota, we are very close to Pine Ridge Reservation. And uh, I didn't work just with Lakota people, but other communities all together, you know, community of Rapid City, then Lakota people, many Lakota people are also living in Rapid City. So, uh, you know, uh, art comedy for that project also included uh, a Lakota person. So that's how uh, I ended up, you know, working with them too. And uh, so this time, you know, this project did really focus on Olone people, Olone tribe. So I go directly to uh, Olone people and really started from zero, you know. That's uh, how we started to build the concept and, you know, uh, what kind of vision we can really keep on. And so it's a big difference from actually my uh, work. I did in uh, South Dakota and here. South Dakota has uh, many more people involved, not only Lakota tribe. Mm. Okay. Uh, there's an architect who wants to know what's the best way to respect the Ohlone culture in their this person's designs or built environments. They don't always have the benefit of a public art program and a call for artists. Is there a possibility of cons consultation for design to embed Ohlone culture in their work, not just referring to plants, but also creative cultural expression? Yeah, I thank you so much for that question. Yes, we've worked. Um, have the opportunity to work with a lot of developers and creating um, ideas of how to incorporate some of our culture. I think the best way to do that if you're in the East Bay is to contact the East Bay folks. Um, if you're in San Francisco area, you should contact the Ramatush people. Um, down in Southern um, part of territory, you should contact uh, Amamutsin and Indian Canyon. So there are different tribes that are from different areas that you so not every, not what I always like to say is not any Ohlone will do. You need to contact the people from whose land you're on. And, and you have done that, you're saying. You have actually um, consulted about, about incorporating Ohlone. Um, yes, and we've, we've had a conversation. We've had conversations every year with the um, architect design program at UC Berkeley and in, trying to uh, talk to them about include being inclusive of native people in the territory they work on. Wow, wow, that was a good question. Uh, so, um, wow, we have a, a few more. We're kind of over time, but I, if if you all can stay a few more minutes, I'd love to just get a couple more of these in. Is that okay, Karina? Are you and Yuki, and Michelle? Um, so, oh my goodness. Um, well, someone uh, wanted to know if the Ohlone home built inside Mission Dolores is a real Ohlone dwelling. I remember that. That Have you seen that structure? Do you mean does somebody actually live in there? No, it, I, <laughs> I, I think it was probably put in as, a, you know, to remember whose, whose land it was on, but it's there. It's in the back, I think, in the garden area of the Mission Dolores uh, on, six, on um, uh, Dolores and 16th. So you're not, you don't know about it or? There was uh, some young people that uh, put together a Tule House replication at Coyote Hills that I'm aware of and it's right by the visitor center and they started to do that a few years back I think it was a either a Girl Scout or Boy Scout troop that wanted to do that and so they worked with some of the uh, park rangers to do that work there and I'm sorry I have not been at the mission in San Francisco to look at that one. Mm -hmm. Okay and uh one person wanted to know, how do you see the relationship between the East Bay shell mounds and those that exist in the Americas and around the world, like maybe Japan, for example, they ask? There are, there are shell mounds all over the world, which is amazing. Um, I think that there are some places that I read about in Japan where people and other places in the world where they will actually build around them. 
rather than to destroy them. Uh, when I was uh, had an opportunity a few years ago to go to Okinawa, I was able to go to some of the places where they had shell mounds. I'm looking forward to being able to go to other places where they exist. They have shell mounds even in Africa. And so some shell mounds are just that, mounds of shells. And some of them are actually um, places of worship. There are shell mounds on the um, in Florida um, and other places there where people um, built on built up these places where they actually had homes on top of. Sometimes our shell mounds also had um, ceremonial uh, spaces on top of them. Um, so there's this connection. Um, and so people all over the world were doing similar kinds of um, actions about putting these mounds together. There are mound builders, of course, in, in Ohio, right? Um, and so I would love to go there one day and see those. And so it's beautiful what people do around the world to create these places of honor for their ancestors um, and uh, to create places that are um, longstanding. I always say that our shell mounds were here much longer and they lasted much longer than anything that we can build today. Um, there's no apartment building or um, store that's gonna last 5,000 years, um, but our shell mounds continue to exist um, to this day. And even though we can't see them above ground, mostly um, what lays beneath um, is still um, an opportunity to, to think about the beauty of what that work was that our ancestors did. That's beautiful. Thank you. Uh, somebody just wrote in and said that the Mission Dolores, the Ohlone um, uh, dwelling that's there was a replica built in 2004. So thank you for that. That's helpful. You know, it's it's 810 and I, I want to be mindful of time and I, I feel like some of the other questions are maybe things people can research on their own or may we can do a part two program at some point. I would certainly love that. I have personally and professionally learned so, so much in this whole process, uh, meeting you all and, uh, and uh, learning about the project and deeply learning about Ohlone traditions and current uh, efforts. And I will be out there at the Shell Mounds for sure. I'm signing up for, <laughs> for to be notified. I will be there with hot cocoa to keep Karina warm. So um, so I think we're going to say good night. I've got a lot of comments in the Q&A because people couldn't put in the chat that they really appreciated this, learned so much and are really grateful. And, and we are as well, the, the museum is, we thank you so much and we wanna continue our relationship with each of you and, and work with you in the future. So thank you all for, being here tonight. Thank you all of our attendees and look for this. This will be up on our YouTube page in a few days so you can watch it again and share it. And yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Karina, Michelle, and the other Michelle. Thank, <laughs> and you. thank you all. Good night. Good night.